We're coming to you today from the Psychedelic Science 2017 conference here in Oakland, California, where the world experts, scientists, researchers, doctors, medical professionals, psychologists, scholars are here spreading their wisdom and findings from their research about psychedelics in all forms, in all applications. And they're here to send a clear message to us that the psychedelics are a gateway for our consciousness to access new plateaus. Yeah, now that's what I'm talking about. Let's go check this out. So we found Don Latin. Let me say that again. <laughs> we found Don Latin, who has written the book Changing Our Minds, Psychedelic Sacraments and the New Psychotherapy. Psychotherapy. That's quite a title. Does the, uh, does the content live up to the title? I think it does. I think it does. We went through a lot of different ideas about titles and things. But um, this is the third book I've written about both the history and the current research and the future prospects of psychedelic research and psychedelic use. Recreational, therapeutic, clinical, underground, above ground. I really write about all of it. I mean, I think because it's all important. It all exists. It's all relevant. It all, it all exists. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I kind of started on this path. I wrote a book called The Harvard Psychedelic Club, right. which came out in 2010. Yeah. And that was a group biography of Timothy Leary, Andrew Weil, Houston Smith, and Ram Dass. And uh, it, it did really well. You it mentioned was, it, a Mensner in there? I interviewed Ralph in there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> He's a little ticked off about that still. Uh -oh. He says, There's no, there was no such uh -oh. thing as the Harvard Psychedelic Pro uh, uh, Club. It was the Harvard Psilocybin Project. I said, I know, Ralph, but that's a better title, the Harvard Psychedelic Club. Good no, Ra you. Ralph is in a, was in a really important part of that. Yeah. You have journalistic group. license yeah. anyway. It's my book. I tell the story the way I want, you, you know. No, but I interviewed Ralph for that, and he's in there. And he's, Ralph is also in this book. Okay. There's a chapter about Ralph. Oh, wonderful. And Ralph is a person who actually is challenging the wisdom, perhaps, of this whole clinical, of these clinical trials, these double-blind placebo models. Everyone is for expanded, responsible, intelligent use of these substances. But there's a real debate, you know, within this community about what's, what's the best way to go. And there are important differences. And so I address those in the book. Um, and, you know, there are, there, there are people that think uh, these organizations shouldn't be promoting legalization. People disagree about that. A lot of it's a political strategy. I think everybody wants to get to the same place, you know, but there are different uh, ideas about how to best do that. So in the book, I really do try to cover, it's a really broad spectrum. Um, everything from, you know, the underground uh, ayahuasca tribes in Northern California. I went to Brazil. I did it. I did the, took the tea there the at a retreat the center uh, out, about two hours. And not exactly the Amazon, but in the jungle outside of Rio. Okay. Uh, that was a very powerful experience. That was my first uh, experience with the tea. Um, I went to Switzerland. I uh, went to Franz Vollenweider's uh, neuroscience lab in Zurich. Okay. Uh, you know, where Carl Jung worked back in the day. Okay. And they're doing all kinds of the... Uh, you know, the scientific work there. I interviewed about, I'd say, three or four dozen of the leading therapists, scientists. So the book is really a look at the human side of this story. And I'm a journalist, and what, what I really love about this are the human stories of healing that people have, whether they're addicts, whether they're uh, Iraqi war vets, uh, women who were sexually abused, uh, young adults with autism dealing with the social anxiety that they have around well, that. Fill in the and, blank. And, your, and, or, your, and just being human. The betterment of well people, as Bob Jesse likes to say. Yeah. You know, there's work about the stud thing. studies with people that are longtime Buddhist meditators who are taking these drugs and legally psilocybin to study the difference in the religious experience between a meditative state with, say, Buddhist meditation versus with uh, psilocybin. So it's all in here. It's really a, a, a survey of, of this really re this psychedelic renaissance that's going on right now. Thank you. Yeah. Well, this, you're, you're making all our points for yeah, us good, good. about the psychedelic renaissance, which we learned from Oliver Meravier with the Fungi Academy down at Lake Atitlan uh -huh. Guatemala, who are teaching uh -huh. people how to cultivate mushrooms and the benefits. And then we have Mike Crowley, who we were talking to about 
The Secret Drugs of Buddhism, his latest book. Uh huh. I'm and not so familiar you, with that. But oh, it sounds well, interesting. There you go. Yeah. You got to check it out because you have a chapter in that respect, and I think he yeah. probably would just take it a little so deeper. 460 pages deeper, wow. I think he said. Wow. So he, he loves to go over there and dig deep into the history and the usage, and the, you know. Great. You Buddhist? Oh, great. You do mushrooms? Let's <laughs> chat. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there's the same publisher. They, uh, Synergetic Press published a new edition of Zig Zag Zen, oh, which okay. is about Buddhism and psychedelics. Uh, it's a great book. And there's a, you know, there's a debate within Buddhism. Is because there's this one of the precepts is no intoxicating substances. So people struggle with that in the Buddhist world. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm obviously I'm I'm however whatever gets you there. That's kind of my, you know, psychedelics are not for everyone. Certainly not for everyone, but they are for some people. And uh, whether it's meditation, whether it's ecstatic dance, whether it's ecstatic sex, whether it's, you know, whatever your discipline is, whatever your practice is, that's fine. If there's a way to get out of yourself, open yourself up, experience awe, wonder, joy, a sense of unity, whatever, whatever works for you, you know? Yeah, it's perfect. Because this is the sense of unity, obviously, is what we're after. Isn't yeah. that the underlying fundamental? Yeah. Yeah, we have and, that need know, to belong, and how are we going to do this if not unified? Yeah, and I think people don't really appreciate the positive effect that psychedelic drugs had on people of my generation. I'm talking about the baby boomers, mm -hmm. you know, the people who came of age in the 60s and 70s. And, you know, there was this huge demographic bulge, you know, all the post-war babies all came of age at the same time. It was a kind of a prosperous time economically. We had time to play. We had the freedom to play. We weren't struggling to pay the rent like young people are now, especially in San Francisco, you know? Especially. Yeah, so we had room to explore. We had freedom to explore. And, you know, that was shut down in a lot of ways for a lot of reasons. Um, but people in my generation, they had those experiences, mostly positive. Some people, you know, of course, had difficult experiences with it. We all know one or two people who never came back <laughs> from that acid trip. But for the vast majority of people, it really changed the way they see the world, where they see themselves, the way they understand spirituality. That, like you said before, it's not so much about doctrine and dogma and denomination, denominationalism. It's about your personal spiritual experience and new ways to find community around that. Uh, I think the whole environmental movement was really fueled by experiences people had in nature. It's like when I was, you know, when I was in college, I used to love to go to the woods and the beach. That's how I would do it. I didn't think of it as a spiritual thing. I mean, I was having fun. I was, it was, I was looking for kicks. I admit it, you know. But I had a new appreciation of nature, the symmetry of nature, the wonder. And I, millions of people had that, and they're still having it. Surprise! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> more so than I, you bargained for, right? That well, was ice cream yeah, cake. Enlightenment. Whatever. Well, sure, I had a good I don't time. Know what enlightenment I got that. is to take, but you know, it's just I, I really, I, I think it really changed the way people look at, at the environment, at ecology, at nature, how they fit into it. Um, you know, I think it's one of the reasons that the war in Vietnam ended. You know, people fought the war. That it fueled a lot of that. You know, you're having these experiences of compassion and empathy and unity for all people, and then we're sending hundreds of thousands of guys across the world to kill people in Vietnam or now in Iraq or Afghanistan. You know, I think these drugs had a, had a positive effect in a lot of ways. Yeah. So you've done all this work. You've, you've put all these words down. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's the best hope for psychedelics for the big picture? What can they do for us? Well, you know... We're at the MAPS conference now, and one, one, one track is this campaign to reschedule these drugs. And it's a very meticulous process. It's very time consuming. It's very expensive mm -hmm. to jump through all the hoops that the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, wants to jump through. But I think it's important. Some people think it's a waste of money, a waste of time. Really, there are a lot of people that think that. To pursue legalization. To pursue it this way, that, that it's just... Um, you know, this double-blind placebo model that in the research that these drugs are different than other drugs. You know, that's really designed for the pharmaceutical companies to test. So anyway, there's a, there's a debate about that, but I think it's important and I'm... Uh, Those drugs are meant to fix something? These yeah. drugs are meant to fix everything. Well, it's... <laughs> they yeah, fix well, the they underlying... Don't fix it. They don't fix everything. You well, know, I don't want to overstate it, really. Well, but if but, perspective is everything, if what we have is our perspective on things, then these are helping us shift what, our perspective what, what, to better understandings they, of the they, world exactly. around they us and better truths, they, then that's what I'm yeah, no, I think what's, but they're d really different than other drugs in the sense that it's not the drug that's doing it, it's the experience that you have mm -hmm. and the insight that you have. Yes, and of course, the challenge is to integrate that into your life. You know, Houston Smith, the scholar of world religions who did a lot of work with this stuff, these, these substances in the early 60s, you know, he said what's important are altered traits, not altered states. Yes. 
right? Yes, Altered course. states of consciousness. And it's however you, you know, get to the altered yeah, traits. Yeah, so what I love about a lot of the work that MAPS and Hefter are sponsoring, these clinical trials, is they really work with the research subjects after the experience to try to find a way to integrate that into their life and to change their life, to become a better person. Because it's really easy to have a powerful, profound, magical, mystical experience. That's easy, you take a pill. That's very easy. To, what, what do you do after the ecstasy? Yeah. How does it change the way you relate to your wife, or your husband, or your coworkers, did or the you world? Did you gain that insight, did, did, that did, empathy, yeah. that feeling you of know, connectedness? And it's really easy for us to overemphasize, or, or overestimate the power of the experience, because it is so powerful. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, I'm speaking from my own experience, you know, it's easy to forget when you go back to daily living after a week or a month. You really have, it's work. You know, it is, it, there's some work. And what I love about this community here is everyone is kind of working on that together, you know? It's a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing. And yeah. it builds and it builds and it builds. And we've been talking about how the, the history of the story and how it started really was, was inflated by, at Harvard University. Yeah, well, with, I mean, there guys. was a lot of research before Harvard, actually. Oh, of you course, know? but at the, and, sort of the launching point of them bringing yeah, it here to the Bay well, Area, the Summer of Love, the, the Acid Test, yeah, the Trips Festival, you know, There's a debate about, you know, was Timothy Leary and all the stuff that came out of Harvard and, and Richard Alpert and Ram Dass, was that a long, of long-term benefit? And there's, I can see it both ways, because, you okay. know, there was a reaction in the university community, the yes. medical community. Look, we lost they, 50 years of research, we, right? Yeah, it, yeah, well, we lost at least 20 years of research, okay, yeah. Okay. And, and, um, and because people forget, Leary and Albert came out of the university, they came out of the university, they, they were clinical psychologists. So uh, for many years, no one proposed doing research on this at the university level. It was like a, a, it was like a death wish for your career. And, and there are a lot of reasons for that. It's not all Timothy Leary's fault. <laughs> Good. But Good. no, and, and he was—he was a very complicated guy. <laughs> he's still guy. a hero to many people. <laughs> he, he, he's a hero and, he's a could... sca and a scoundrel. He would yes, say that himself. He's yes, both. Of course, of he, course. He's, but he, you know, he so, still someone, asked, us. someone asked him one time. You know, sometimes you seem like such a profound being, a prophet. Other times you seem like a shameless self-promoter, a vicious, mean-spirited guy. What's the? Who's the real Tim Leary? Right. You know what he said? You get the Timothy Leary you deserve. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> I mean, that's a classic. That's a classic Tim Leary line, right? Beautiful. You know, and all people would point out all the contradictions that he had. You know, he'd say one thing and then he'd say another thing, and you know, and he said, you know, well, looking back on his life lately, he said about 33 percent of what I said was basically a lie. Thirty-three percent was eh, kind of bullshit, but thirty-three percent of it was just a gem. With pearls of wisdom. So I'm batting 333. That puts me in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> so he, he said that. In, he said that about himself. Yeah. So he was a complicated. He was a complicated character. Yeah. Um, um, like but the a rest brilliant, of us. Yeah. Well, he was a little. Uh, he was a brilliant guy. Yeah. He was a brilliant guy. But he, but you know, a complicated man. You know, a complicated man. Well, he still at least left us with turn on, tune in, drop, drop out. out. Yeah. And. Um, I think it's... And like it's, I said, Rick's, Rick's version of that is turn on, tune in, bill your insurance company. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> For the medical... <laughs> the the dropout, you know, the dropout was the most controversial part of that, including people who were sympathetic at the time because people thought that meant don't be involved in politics. You know, there was a real division back then among the people that were into like LSD and enlightenment and those who were working, you know, in political, the, the new left. So there was a real split in the counterculture around that. And so when Leary said drop out, a lot of people I think maybe misunderstood it. He wasn't saying don't work for change, right? Don't go off in a cave. He was saying don't play the corporate game. Yeah, you know, drop out of the story that the they want, system, the system wants you to the play. System yeah. And, you know, they always talk about the game, don't play the yeah. game. Yeah. There's a lot of truth and wisdom in that, yeah. you know, and so but but you know, uh, it's sort of a different time now. It really is. Yeah. But that spirit is seems to be reviving. It's the psychedelic renaissance. Yeah. It's yeah. on. Yeah. And we're so excited to be here and be a part of yeah. it. And we appreciate you sharing your wisdom and your time, of course. Happy and to. Uh, we're spreading a message of love. And I think psychedelics is it's love. Yeah. It's yeah. insight. It's connection. It's nurturing of the soul, of the spirit, of the yeah. mind. Especially That's love. Especially, I think MDMA really does, really opens up your heart. The These drugs are different. You know, psilocybin, LSD, they're different. But in terms of the love, you, yeah. you want to talk about yeah. love, the the MDMA love. is... It's like when I take it, I think, why don't I always feel this way? I know. This is how I should feel. I know. 
you know? Huxley said the same thing when he first took Mescaline, you know, he said, this is how one ought to feel, is what he said. And I, I really see that. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so okay. much for your Thank time. Okay, thank you. Thanks. And now, I now share love. We always love to wrap with a hug. All right. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you.